Okay, thanks. Volume is good in the back. If I get excited, I might start yelling, so hopefully you can cover your ears or something. Great, so I'm really excited to be here for part of this fantastic Darwin Day lineup of events that you've had this year and have had for many years. I'm a little bit, um, a little bit jealous, in fact, of how nice those events are here, so thank you for inviting me. And I'm just going to tell you some stories that really encompass several decades of work. Not all of it will be my own work, but I just want to give you a, a picture of how we can use microbes to study evolution and what we've learned through that process. Great. So here's one of my uh, colleagues, Zachary Blount, kind of looking up at Charles Darwin. And I, I feel like I do have to mention Darwin, but I will not quote Darwin, I'm sorry, which probably happens at many Darwin Day talks. Um, but really, Darwin was a fantastic thinker. You know, he spent most of his time in this house thinking about things he had seen decades earlier and trying to synthesize this knowledge and a great science communicator. So I think that's one reason that it's, it's nice to recognize that and his role, of course, in, the, in coming up with the, uh, the theories of natural selection and evolution. Great. So... We're going to talk today mostly about kind of Darwinian evolution is one term for it, or evolution by natural selection. And that the ingredients that you need are for evolution, evolution is just change over time. But for this particular kind of evolution, you need heritable variation of some kind so that the offspring inherit some characteristics or some mixture of genes from their parents. And some of those can lead to increased fitness or survival. And that kind of means how many offspring make it into the next generation and future generations. So here's our state tree, the pecan tree. And one measure of the fitness of a pecan tree might be how many pecans it makes. But that's not everything. It's how many of those pecans land in the right place, grow up into new trees, lead to new, more pecans, and things like this. Very hard to measure out in nature, right, uh, what the fitness of a pecan tree is. So we're going to talk about simpler systems here today where we can do this very quantitatively. Great, and I want to mention that maybe little lesser known things that Darwin synthesized in The Origin of Species. One is that probably many of you know about Darwin's finches here on the left, right? He observed these in the Galapagos Islands. He saw that they had different characteristics that were, especially their beaks, which are useful for different kinds of food, you know, cracking these nuts versus these other things. And, but you may not know that he actually devotes, devotes quite a bit of time in later books and mentions The Origin of Species pigeon fanciers who were breeding crazy looking pigeons as part of things. And that was an example of kind of artificial selection and watching evolution happen in very close to real time. And, and so I think that's kind of a lot along the lines of what we are, are um, uh, going to talk about today. Systems where we can see things change very rapidly, right? Right. And so there are some challenges with studying evolution. I think one reason that people have trouble thinking about evolution is just that it takes so long for certain kinds of evolution to happen. So this is a challenge that, and you have to look back, you know, in the fossil record, many, many millions of years to think about uh, how fossils are placed and how those evolved and which forms um, were related to what forms and related to current life. And, uh, you know, it even takes millions of years to look back in the evolutionary history of hominids and try to, to piece together how the relationships there are kind of teased out. So evolution takes a long time. So it's not a very easy science to watch happen. But there are some systems where you can do that. And when you're able to do that, you're also able to deal with kind of these missing gaps that you have. That today I can go out and I can look at the huge variety of life. And as Darwin thought about, this life has common ancestors that you can track back. But just by definition, those common ancestors have disappeared, maybe less left fossil remnants, but the fossil remnants may not actually be the ancestors. They're kind of cousins of other things, and they're offshoots and branches. And so it takes a lot of work to try to reconstruct that. And by definition, it's so long in the past sometimes that we can't quite figure out what's happened. So that's one limitation to studying evolution in a lot of systems. We can overcome it, and we can, we can get very good guesses at what was going on in the past with a lot of molecular techniques especially. And then one other limitation, if you start thinking about our world, is that we only have one world. So kind of there's only one history writ large of evolution that has happened. Now, there are lots of interesting, interesting systems where you can go and look at a lot of lakes in one area, and you can actually see that evolution happened convergently in similar ways in all of those lakes. So there's microenvironments where you have replication of the experiment of evolution, for example. But writ large, we kind of only have one world. And people who've gone back and studied the finches in the Galapagos more recently, you see that there's a lot of chance in the outcomes of evolution. A tropical storm comes, a drought comes, it changes the plants that are on the islands, it changes which finches are being selected. 
and there's, the weather is making some of that happen, right? And so you don't have a control over these natural environments in a way that you can do experiments where you can test hypotheses and kind of statistically examine outcomes one way or the other versus you kind of have one thing that you got to see. And Stephen Jay Gould in this book, which is about the Burgess Shale, like an explosion of, uh, of fossils and very interesting life forms that existed um, in, in these fossils, uh, had this thought experiment of what if you could replay the tape of evolution? What if you could go back to that point and basically start over the world? Would the current diversity of life on Earth resemble what it does today, or would it be different just due to chance events? Certain, certain uh, species, animals being in the right place at the right time, and then therefore reproducing and, uh, and being extant today. So I'm going to talk today about this experiment that was started in 1988 by Richard Linsky. He started at UC Irvine, but he moved a few years later to Michigan State, and he's still at Michigan State University. And I worked with him during my postdoctoral research. I kind of started my own lab, did my own things for a while, but he's getting close to retirement, and he wanted somebody to continue this experiment on because we've learned a lot of interesting things about it, and that's why I want to talk to, talk to you to, today about. And really, we, why he started this experiment was... He wanted to make his own evolutionary histories to study and have control over them so that he could really get to the nitty-gritty details of what's going on, mathematically describe things, and, and really just see what's happening, chance versus necessity, convergent evolution. A lot of these things could be tested in the system. And I should say that he was actually a, a kind of discouraged ecologist. He had, done, he had done some experiments one summer where he like, set all these traps to get beetles, and he had some beautiful design of where the traps were and all this kind of stuff. And then he like caught no beetles. And he was like, my goodness, there has to be an easier way to study these things. And so then he transitioned and started working with some microbiologists during his later training and decided to start this, this very simple yet elegant experiment that I'll explain. But first, I should say also that this is an entire field. There are many people who use microorganisms to study evolution because there are just some advantages to working with them. One of them is that they're really cheap and easy to feed, right? They're very tiny. You just need a test tube, a flask, something like that, some sugar water, basically. And you have complete control over their environment. You can put them in your little glass container at some temperature, shaking at some revolutions per minute, and you control exactly what's going on, which means it's reproducible. I can do an experiment, I can tell you how to do the experiment, and we can get the same results. And the other thing is that they reproduce really rapidly. So, you know, E. coli, the bacterium I'll be talking about today, which is normally a denizen of our guts. This E. coli has been in the lab for decades before this experiment started. It can reproduce under optimal conditions about every half hour it will double, which is quite fast. That's its generation time, much different than an animal or a plant, a pecan tree, something else, right? It takes a lot longer to go from the offspring growing up and having another offspring. And also bacteria are kind of easy to study because their genomes are small. I can sequence 1,000 E. coli bacteria for the same cost as one human genome, for example. Um, they're just a lot more compact in how they store their information. And so that gives us more power to use certain methods of modern biology. But the coolest part is that you can freeze bacteria, you can leave them there for decades, you can thaw them out, and they are alive, and they are unchanged which means that we can make a living fossil record and we could do experiments which would be impossible with mice or fruit flies, you know, mix together ones from decades ago, put them in some kind of competition and see how they interact with ones from today that have been evolving in the meantime. And um, tomorrow I'm, I'm giving a talk over at UT Tyler where I'll focus a little bit on some of the, the reasons that, other reasons that we care about microbial evolution. So related to medicine, microbes can be um, you know, bad for us. There are pathogens and things like this. Um, but also they're useful for biotechnology and we actually like some microbes and design microbes to do useful things as well. Great, so here's the setup of the experiment. I'm gonna show a movie that kind of shows what's happening a little bit, just so that you can imagine what the experiment actually looks like and you know, how simple it is and some of what's going on. But one of the really key things is, is that there's 12 different flasks, each of which has E. coli. They were all started from exactly the same E. coli. So they started initially exactly the same with an E. coli, which was one cell, one genome, no diversity at all. All the diversity it develops is due to mutations while these E. coli replicate, and some of those mutations are good, some of those mutations are deleterious, and I'll kind of cover what's going on and how to think about that in a minute. And then we give them this minimal chemically defined media, it's a mixture of salts, 
uh, ions like magnesium they need, ammonia, and then the real key thing is that we add a little bit of glucose, the, one of the simplest and most fundamental sugars, it's our blood sugar, right, um, to these flasks. And we add only a little bit of that. And so that's like the thing that they are really competing for and they need. Everything else, there's excess of it. And so we focus down their competition to this one resource. And we give them very small amounts of it as well. And we also, we, we transfer one one hundredth of the population each day. And then you can imagine that they get fed. They kind of wake up from their stupor of not, of not growing. They grow for a little while. In fact, they're done growing in about six, seven, eight hours, and then they sit there for the rest of the 24 hours. They don't really die under these conditions. They're fairly happy, but they're not growing for most of the cycle. And if you do that, the math, the log base two of 100 means that there's about 6.67 doublings of all the cells during that time, and that would be the number of generations that pass each day. And if you do that every single day for a year, you can get about 2,400 generations to pass under these conditions. Great, so this shows my lab manager, Jack, doing this a few months ago, just to show you what it really looks like. Of course, we try to be very sterile because you don't want other microbes coming into our little microcosms and, and interfering with what's going on. Occasionally it happens, but we have these frozen stocks we can go back to that are clean, so we can always recover. In fact, the frozen stocks are one of the really key things about this. It's kind of like you save your game when you're playing Zelda or something like this, right? You can just go back to your saved game if something goes wrong. And so this is showing us taking him out of the incubator. He's kind of, the one on the right here is, has grown. It just looks like really dilute milk. It doesn't look like much has happened. And the one on the left was the clean blank that we inoculate to make sure that our media is not contaminated. So he's gonna transfer 100 microliters into 10 milliliters in these little tiny flasks that we use. I mean, it's great. You get to play with flames if you're a microbiologist, right? But this is to create kind of a sterile environment where there's positive air pressure pushing out so dust is not falling in what we're doing here. These are the 12 different populations, and uh, we're going to kind of fast forward here and not show you him doing the entire procedure, which takes maybe 15, 20 minutes each day to complete. Not so long. But you've got to be pretty careful. And... Then we just pop them back in the incubator and go for another day. You can see we have a little odometer here where we keep track of the generations and we flip things over as we go to kind of keep track of what's going on. And they also get a privileged space. They're the only, only experiments that go on in this particular incubator, partly because it's really high and it's hard to like, you know, go into it. So it's the least convenient one. And another thing we do is we kind of save things for one day. So if something goes wrong, something breaks, we can just go back one day without having to go to the freezer and kind of lose time. Because we only freeze them down about every three months. Um, and so if something goes wrong, we have to go back after that. Great. So that's kind of the setup of the experiment. I'm going to just mash together a lot of stories that are over decades of work by more than 100 people. So I don't have time to acknowledge all of them by name, but I just want to, at the very beginning, acknowledge that many, many people have been involved in this experiment, including propagating the bacteria every day and helping with freezing it, but also people at other universities who have studied these resources. We share them freely with people to ask new questions, use new methods on them. And I really do have to mention one person, though, near Jahajala, who was the lab manager who, for more than a decade, handled all the transfers every single weekday. And so she is the champion of all time. No one will ever contribute more to the, the propagation of this experiment than her. And we have a website where you can kind of see more details and some news if you want to check that out later. All right, so the history of the experiment is that it started in 1988 in the Linsky Lab, a transition to Michigan State. I was a postdoc from 2006 to 2010. I started my own lab at UT Austin, kind of here. And then we decided we would trade the experiment off to me. I'm a bit younger than Rich. Hopefully I can keep it going for a couple of decades if I keep my health up, you know, not too stressed for me, a professor, things like this. And we're up to 78,896 generations, which means I've only done 3,800 of the complete generations that have gone by in my lab at this point. So not a lot, but if you visit me in eight years, we're gonna flip over the next number and we'll be at 100,000 generations, which will definitely be a milestone. Eight more years, we'll get there and we'll celebrate. Um, I do want to say that if you kind of convert this to human generation years, you might reach something that is like 1.6 million years of hominid evolution, which is verging on like how long we think Homo sapiens has been around, right? And so that just gives you an idea of how deep the evolutionary history is. It's not exactly equivalent. Microbes are not the same as humans in terms of in our genetics and all that kind of stuff, but to, to give you something to think about.
Great. So I talked about this freezing of things, and I just want to bring up a few other things that are really important about being able to freeze these samples and revive them later. One is that new techniques have come around to this experiment that did not exist in 1988, that we can study in way in more depth, especially genome sequencing, single cell analyses, all kinds of cool things we can do to the bacteria that did not exist at all in 1988. And we can even make copies of these samples, so I can, I'm never going to run out of these frozen stocks because I can just grow them for one day and they don't really change. And then I have these stocks and I can send them to my friend in, in France, my friend in Boston, my friend in Michigan, and then we all have copies of them so the record will not be lost if my freezer dies, for example. So we have backups all around. So that's really great. And also, as I said, sometimes things become contaminated or something weird happens and we just decide, oh, we better go back and start over again. Um, right, great. And then one other key thing that's going to be important for the stories I'm going to tell you is that we can quantitatively measure fitness, the number of offspring that different, uh, different genomes that have diverged in different ways contribute to further generations. And we do that, we have this trick where some of our bacteria form red colonies, so this is a dilution of one of these cultures to where each of these started as one colony, and so it's of one type. And I can count how many I have of one type versus the other type based on these colors. And now I can compete them 50-50. I take the ancestor and like the evolved one, I put them together and initially they're close to 50-50 on the one on the left. But then I grow them through one exact day of the normal cycle that would happen during the evolution experiment. And the evolved ones are better. And so I get more representation of the red type over here. And by how much that changes gives me a number of how much the relative fitness has changed in the experiment. And so this has prov proven to be quite useful. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about three short stories here. Let's see how I'm doing on time, okay. And the first one is a little more background. It's how to think about, we have a microbe, it's dividing, occasionally there are mutations popping up in some of its offspring, then occasionally there are mutations in those offspring, and we're adding up mutations over time. And the mutations that increase in frequency in the population are the ones that are outcompeting the ancestor or outcompeting the other mutants that are in the population. And how do we think about how fast this is happening, how, what, what's going on with these mutations? And then I'm going to tell you about two stories where mixing together different mutations leads to kind of interesting outcomes. Uh, one's a bit of an evolutionary race where there's a tortoise and a hare type analogy to what's going on. And the other one is an evolutionary innovation where um, things move from using the glucose to using citric acid, which is a, an ingredient in tart candies, which is why we have this kind of title up here. Okay, so what happens with these evolving bacteria? One of the first things they could do, even back in the 80s and early 90s, is they could look at the bacteria under a microscope. And they noticed the bacteria were becoming bigger over time. So this was evidence that there was selection for some larger cell size. And that can be a little bit mixed up with growing fast. So E. coli that grows faster gets bigger, but also the aspect ratio, the shape changes a little bit of these cells. We don't completely understand why, but what we, I can tell you is that all 12 of these separate evolutionary histories that we started the same way, but have evolved separately, all convergently do this to some aspect. So all of them evolved very much the same way. This was something that was going to happen and is beneficial in this environment um, overall if you tried running the experiment many times. And also it kind of, it kind of flattens off very early 10,000 generations out of the almost 80,000 that we have right now as, as far as this goes. The other thing we could do is we could measure that fitness value that I've said. And initially, they kind of thought that some flasks might evolve faster than other flasks because they might get lucky and get some very rare beneficial mutation. But what it turned out is that almost all of their fitnesses go up at exactly the same rate too. So that was also very parallel, consistent between the evolutionary histories that we had. And the example I was showing you before to calibrate you, a 1.4 on this scale is that change that I showed you where we go from 50-50 when I mix them to 90 to 10 after just one 24-hour cycle. So that is a huge advantage, right? You compound that every single day and very rapidly the white type would go extinct over in, in the history here. So that's a 1.4 is a huge fitness advantage. They're much, much more fit in this environment than their ancestors. And they also, this also looked like kind of it was done, like it had just plateaued and not much was going to happen until we started looking really more quantitatively and over longer periods of time. And so now I have compressed in time all the data up to 20,000 generations. 
And you can see that it still looks like it's kind of reaching this peak, but I have two models, one of which has kind of a maximum, the red. So it's going to max out at some asymptotic value. And then I have this other model that kind of will keep going up, but it'll keep going up slower and slower and slower over time. And that blue model fits the data out to the current day better. So it's not that they've stopped evolving, it's just that it's kind of an optimization process. Early on, it's very easy to improve. There's many pathways to improve by large amounts. Later, it gets harder and harder to find something to tweak just a little bit to improve, but they do continue to improve. And we've also taken the 60,000, compared it to the 50,000, and we can see that they are still more fit. So they're still evolving to be better over time, and this, even on these long periods of time. All right, so why do they become more fit? It's because there are mutations happening to their genomes that affect the function of a cell. Bacterial cells, a lot of what they do is metabolism. They move chemical compounds from the things we're giving them to make all of the amino acids, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates that they need to make a new cell, right? So a lot of it's kind of the chemical factory. But also it needs to turn things on at certain times, organize itself, put, put things in the membrane in the right places. So very complex process, right, to be optimized. And because of that, it's a complex organism it has a genome of about 5 million base pairs. And most of the time, when, you, when it replicates, there is no mutation. So about 99.8% of the time, the offspring of an E. coli cell is the exact same. It's just as boring as that first cell right here. About 0.2% of the time, it has a mutation. And most of those mutations cause something to malfunction. So the cells stop replicating. They're worse off. Or sometimes they just do nothing. They just are not important. They don't change the meaning of the, the information that's in the genome. Super rarely, maybe one in 200,000 times that we have the, these uh, cells divide, we get a beneficial mutation that does something new or better in, this, in, in these environments. So super rare. So with these numbers, it's like, well, how does anything ever happen if these events are so rare? But you have to remember the other side of the equation is that a lot of bacteria fit in one of these flasks. And so the numbers of bacteria are massive. They're huge. Even after we dilute them, it's 10 to the 7th cells. Once they grow up that 100-fold, it's 10 to the 9th cells, a billion cells. And so you kind of do the math and you multiply these two things together and you find out that in one of the flasks, there's like thousands of these beneficial mutations appearing and competing. A lot of them are lost when we dilute it, but if they're good enough and better enough and they start increasing in frequency, they have better chances of making it through that dilution bottleneck each day. And uh, yes, yes, yes. So lots, lots of mutations happening and, uh, and because there are lots of cells. And in fact, if you kind of calculate the overall mutation rate and multiply these numbers together, think about the genome size, it turns out that within a few days or weeks, probably we are sampling every single base pair change in the E. coli genome in these populations. So literally like every single possible mutant is arising uh, after a very small amount of time, the numbers are so large. Great, so we start with one thing and at the very beginning of the experiment, diversity develops. We have one step away, many, many different cells with many, many different mutations. And this is an experiment where we tracked each of these lines as one type of bacteria with a different mutation. A mutation in a certain gene, the colors are different genes, so actually there's a lot with mutations in the same genes, but they're different mutations. So each of these is a different lineage of bacteria with a different mutation. And what I'm showing you is that they are, are, are all increasing in frequency. This is a logarithmic scale. And that's because they're outcompeting the ancestor. These are those beneficial mutations and they're going up. But I want you to see that there's a lot of the beneficial mutations and that actually they're competing with one another. At this point, they all have taken over the population. So they're competing versus one another and they're all equal because they're no longer driving the ancestor extinct. Then eventually one gets a second mutation and that one kind of takes off and all these other ones start going away. So we have these steps of evolution where we start with one genome. There's diversity develops kind of in the adjacent neighborhood of that genome, one mutation away, many different possible one mutations away. Eventually, one of those is going to kind of win, and it will develop diversity. That one will win. It will develop diversity, so on and so forth. And you get these steps of evolution happening, these kind of, we call them sweeps, where it's something starts at low frequency and it becomes high frequency. And then eventually, everything in the population is descended from that type that had the first mutation. So you get these kind of sweeps going through. So this is a different way of showing that that's a little bit complicated to look at. Here, abundance is this axis. So if a swath and initially gray is the first thing here, gray is the ancestor, it's 100% of the population. This shows that a mutation in this gene, it's not important which gene it is, appeared 
in the ancestor started rising in frequency and displacing the other types. The ancestor was going extinct, the gray lines. And then a new mutation also appeared over here. And then mutations start getting added on. So each time a wedge comes out of an earlier color, it's added on to the earlier mutations. So we're building up more and more mutations. And what you, I hope you can see is that there's kind of this entire red part down here that builds up kind of reddish colors over time. And there's this other part that's building up blue and green. And those are separate. They're diverged. And each is getting many, many mutations. And eventually, there's like competition. They're kind of going up and down and battling it out. But they both have different sets of beneficial mutations they're adding together. And eventually, the red kind drives the other one extinct and wins. Then everything in the population is derived from that type. So you get these, you, you get not just one mutation appearing and it winning, you get whole cohorts of separate mutations and lineages that are more complicated that compete for a while before one takes over, which is important because interactions between those mutations and pathways can build up because of that. So we call these like cohorts of mutations. They're cooperating together because they all ended up in the same genome. Great. And, and so this, the picture of what I showed you before is kind of that linear thing, but actually there's all these branches going on and a lot of exploration of space that's happening. Each thing is diversifying and eventually some of these are dead ends in terms of adding together the mutations that we get in different directions. All right. So one other thing to pay attention to is now I need to connect to this, this vision of mutations back to the fitness. And what we do know is if I look at the first mutation that happened, and I can actually just, I can use genetics to put that back in the ancestral E. coli, so it's the only mutation there. It's really beneficial. It's like 8% or 10% benefit, which is a lot out of the 40% that we were increasing in the, what the slide I was showing you. But if I take a later one out, it's like not as good. It will be to 5, 6, 7, 8. And they keep becoming smaller and smaller over time. And that's the reason that evolution is kind of slowing in terms of the fitness gain. But what was kind of odd to us is we thought that also the number of mutations that was appearing over time should be slowing and following kind of the same kind of curve. Because you have good, well, this one good beneficial mutation, and maybe it takes longer and longer and longer to, to kind of build up mutations and have them sweep through the population because they're not as good later. It should take longer for them. Um, but actually, if we measure the number of mutations over time, it's almost a line. The mutations are appearing over and over again when we pick the bacteria out. The number just keeps increasing linearly. And so you need some way to explain the discrepancy between these two things. And here's where I need to stress that it's not that every single bacterial cell is kind of competing versus the ancestor. It's competing versus everything else that was there at the same time. And the way that you get the math to work out here is really kind of examining this. It's each of these, the mut each of these mutants is not competing versus, is competing versus the ancestor at first, but they're competing versus each other. So even though they're all super beneficial, the one that wins only is like slightly better than the other ones. And that slightly betterness of the best one versus the second best one remains kind of constant through the experiment as it's exploring the space. And so you can imagine that at first it's like two trains, the super beneficial mutations going really fast, but one train is going one mile per hour faster. And so it's the one that wins. And later, they're kind of just runners. But one is going one mile per hour faster, and so it wins. And so that one mile per hour difference is the thing that determines how fast the mutations are appearing over time and why we get that constant rate. It's because the marginal benefit is kind of remaining the same over time. And this is just a different way of showing these cohorts of mutations going from 0% frequency up. And when several lines go together, all of those mutations were together. And they actually got together while they were still super low in frequency and didn't win until they were higher frequency. OK, so hopefully you have a little bit of an idea of what's going on with mutations in these populations now. Now I'm going to tell you about some interesting evolutionary races, um, this tortoise versus hare race. The story here is in one of the flasks, and it's very, very early in the experiment, just the first few hundred to up to 1,500 generations. This is a, a graphic like I was showing you before where we have the ancestral type in gray, we have a mutation appear, this light blue, and then another mutation appear on top of the dark blue, or red, and so on and so forth. So I'm showing that lineage here. If I traced this, I would be adding up this set of mutations over here. And then I have some other ones, this green kind, and you can see the green kind loses, right? It, it lost out. This doesn't show all the mutations. It just shows the ones we knew about when we did this experiment. But we can say that these types up here are the ones that are going to eventually lose. The ones down here are the ones that eventually won. And if we pick these out at 500 generations, you would say, yeah, if I mix them together and I compete these versus these, the blue kind should win, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to win. But weirdly, when we did that and we competed them head to head, it was the opposite. The ones that eventually lost were really more fit. They were like 6.2% more fit 
That's a huge difference when you compound it every single day, such that actually the ones that eventually won should have gone extinct in 350 generations if evolution had kind of stopped at this point. Yet they did, they, they won, right? And so why is that? Um, you know, one possible explanation always is they somehow got lucky, and that subpopulation sampled a super beneficial mutation. And that kind of explains what happens. Uh, another one would be that somehow they have a greater potential for sampling beneficial mutations due to the way that their pathways and metabolism have been changed due to those earlier mutations. So something about that is changing the ability for future mutations to be beneficial. And what's cool about these experiments is we can actually just go back in time and say, well, what would happen if we tried 20 times from each of these starting points? Which one would win if we started over again? If it's the kind of lucky by chance one, then the eventual winners, should, they shouldn't eventually win in most of these cases. But if there's something really fundamental to how their first mutations affected their future ability to evolve, we would expect reliably for the ones that were behind to eventually win to the ones that were ahead but eventually lost. So this is an example of replaying the tape, just going back to the freezer, starting a whole other offshoot experiment on the side while we continue the main experiment you know, every single day to develop that history. And it turns out when you do this, and to, just to summarize across all of our different replicate populations and lots of these fitness measurements with counting colonies and all that kind of stuff, we, have, we had a method where we could kind of figure out what happens one mutation further. And after one mutation further, after each of the starting points, the gap has been narrowed. The ones that were behind are closer. And after 883 generations of doing this, it is reliably flipped. So that the ones that were behind reliably, on average, would have won in the long run. So it's, there actually is something different about their future potential to evolve. And so, you know, wh why is that the case? What's going on here? I'm not going to tell you a ton about mutations and molecular mechanisms here. It's just way too much to cover. You can talk to me afterwards if you're interested. But I would say that a lot of the early mutations in the evolution experiment kind of cause the bacteria to wake up faster. When you transfer them to the new food, they have to turn back on production of a lot of things. And they become faster at doing that because there's a huge advantage to get a jump start on the day, right? Early bird gets the worm. Um, and so a lot of these early mutations are related to that. And there were, there were different mutations in the winners and losers. I apologize. The colors are kind of reversed here. But the top and the bottom is what's going on. Right. And so this mutation right here um, and this mutation right here determined what happened in these replay experiments. We could see whether a certain particular gene was mutated in those 20 examples where we started with this one and the 20 examples where we started with this one. And there was one gene that only was mutated in this kind. And actually, if we go in, we put that mutation back into each kind. It's not beneficial at all to this type. It's super beneficial to this type. So there's something about these other mutations that's interacting with that mutation. And it turns out um, that there's a few reasons that this other mutation is happening fast. One is that it involves loss of function of this gene. So there's literally like hundreds of different ways for it to happen. Whereas the mutations that occur in this gene, which we think have similar effects and they're operating in the same pathway, you have to tweak the function of a gene. So only a few little changes can happen. So just by chance, you're more likely to find these things early. And it's going to take a little bit longer for evolution to explore and find these things in the conjunction with all the earlier mutations. So that's one reason this happens early and this happens late. Um, but we also think that this and this are doing the same thing. They're helping the cells wake up earlier, helping them develop, change how they deal with starvation and transitions in and out of starvation. But it turns out that this one is probably doing it in a way where it has the same effect this way, downstream in one regulatory pathway. But it has some side effects. In fact, it messes up making fatty acids, which are part of the membrane. And it turns out it makes probably the cells are a little bit leaky and they're having some problems. They're like kind of unstable. It's a side effect. Overall, it's a great mutation that's beneficial. But due to this, what it's doing to the cell, it's putting it near like kind of a, a stability threshold. It's like near the edge now. So that certain mutations will make it kind of fall off the edge, not be beneficial. And this is restricting its future ability to evolve. So that's our understanding of what's molecularly kind of going on in this case. And I should say that actually mutations in that same dead end gene, the eventual loser one, happened in six out of the 12 flasks when we went back and really looked genetically at what was happening in the early generations. Every single time they lost, anything with that mutation was going to lose in the long run, even one time where they were almost essentially all of the population for a little while. They were 99%, but still they went away. 
So they're, they're shutting the door on future adaptation so much that they were just a reliable dead end. So I'm going to give one slightly different analogy for what's going on with these interactions between mutations to see if it can kind of connect with uh, you to get you to understand what's going on here. And it's, it's a poker analogy. So imagine that you have this starting hand, three, nine, ten of hearts, right? So not, not a great starting hand, but we're going to draw two more cards. And, you know, there could be certain different draws. Here we added this nine of clubs here. Here we added this king of hearts. So actually now this hand is winning because it has a pair of nines. This hand has now a king high. It's better. It's better than before. It's improved. But, you know, it's, it's behind, right? But each of these has different potential for future hands that you can get with the next draw and card. The one on the bottom, if I draw another heart, I get a flush, a really good hand. The one on top, I cannot access that. In fact, the best I could do is another nine, which is three nines. And so due to these early cards, it determines that this one has more potential to evolve. And if you're sampling like lots of cards, right, in the evolution, you're more likely to be able to kind of jumpstart, leapfrog things and kind of move this direction. So this is how we think about these steps kind of adding together and interactions between them in one way. Great. So kind of just to, to summarize these trajectories early on, even if they're most beneficial in the short term, because these populations are large and they're sampling so many combinations and mutations, they kind of avoid certain dead ends by doing this, by sampling so many things. The ones that remain most able to evolve can, can, can propagate and win out in the long run. So the tortoise strategy, you know, kind of won out in this particular example. Great. So now I'm going to tell you about one of the more exciting things that happened in this experiment and surprising things. You know, maybe what I'm telling you before is bacteria evolved to grow more quickly. You expected that. It's kind of interesting some of the details and how that happens, and we can quantitatively understand it by studying the system. But this, this was a surprise. So in this medium that we have right here, I told you glucose was there. There's not very much of it. It's the limiting nutrient, and the bacteria are competing for it. It turns out due to kind of historical reasons, there's a ton of citric acid, citrate, in there. It's there to help the bacteria take up iron, and it's just part of the recipe they used. And they kept the normal amount that was in that recipe, but they took, normally people would add like tons more glucose, and they made the glucose very restricted. So in terms of the raw amount of like carbon that's in these compounds, there's a lot more carbon in the citric acid there. But bacteria, the, the E. bacteria, the E. coli can't access it. They don't use it under these conditions where we're shaking them in the flasks and lab at all. So it's this huge untapped nutrient source. And it's been there for the entire history of the experiment. But after 13 years, one of the 12 populations accessed that nutrient. It looked like this. If you're measuring like cell density, this is like a relative scale. Normally it's like this. And then suddenly it became sevenfold higher. In fact, we threw away the, they, it was before my time, they threw away the experiment when this happened. They thought it was contaminated with some other bacterium, and they went back to the freezer. And then it happened again, and then they threw it away again. It happened a third time, and they're like, oh, we should check and make sure, that they see if this is our E. coli. And so it took them a while to kind of realize that that was what, going, what was going on. And, it, and, you know, they learned, the bacteria evolved in a way that allowed them to access this nutrient. But this was very rare, right? And, and so it's taken kind of a long time to figure out how that was possible and what's going on and how to think about this kind of interesting evolutionary novelty innovation, tapping a new niche, spreading out the ecology of the experiment. You know, you can say a lot of things about this. One thing that was learned really early on is that when, although we had this trans, sharp transition where this happened, I'm going to call that the CIT plus trait, utilizing citrate. And if you put them on these, these petri dishes with only citric acid there, you can grow little colonies and you can see them, the ones that have done that. But it turns out there's like a little indicator media where you can get a little color change if they're even using citric acid a little bit. And it turns out that actually a little bit earlier, about 1,500 generations earlier, you see some that are like slightly using the citrate. So this didn't appear from nothing. It appeared from something that was so rudimentary and kind of weak that we didn't even notice it at first in the experiment to going back to our frozen fossil record, thawing things out and doing some more experiments. All right, so what's going on here? I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna tell you the mechanism um, first and we'll talk a little bit about why it's so rare, which is really kind of the mystery here. It's so beneficial, like why is it not happening in all 12 flasks? And why did it take so long to happen? 
So we learned the mutation that makes them weakly able to use citric acid. And it kind of makes sense. It turns on a transporter that's normally only on when E. coli is grown with no oxygen present. And it turns on a transporter that will take citric acid into the cell, but it actually has to export something from the cell at the same time as an exchange. And this makes it not quite always good for the bacteria to exchange that thing. And that's probably why it's only weakly citrate plus, because it can bring some in and it can pump some of this out, but it only has so much of this it can spare based on how it's functioning. So it can't actually use all of the citric acid. Um, so a little bit. The mutation that happens here is very cool, though. There's a piece of the genome, and it gets copied twice end to end. So there's two copies of it. And that puts at the, the junction between them two things juxtaposed in a new, a new way that they were not there originally. One of them is a promoter, so it makes the messenger RNA. And it's a promoter from a gene that's just like always on in the cell, a housekeeping gene, we call them. And so that's always on, and it puts it on in front of this gene, which is normally way at the end of something that's only turned on when oxygen is not present. And it turns on that gene, so that gene is essentially always on at some level. And in fact, actually, there's more copies that get made of this that make even more copies of that thing and a higher amount of it uh, over time. So this alone will give you that first step. It will make you slightly able to use citric acid. And what gives you the full ability to use citric acid is a second mutation, which turns on a second transport protein. That one is able to re-import the thing that the other one exported, and then use the energy gradient of the cell. Cells that use this as kind of a common currency of their energy, um, pumping protons across membranes. And so at this point, they can basically import as much all of the citrate, and they become full-blown CIT plus cells. And this is kind of just showing that when you add together only those two mutations in the ancestor, no other mutations present, they give really strong ability to use citric acid. So these two mutations alone are sufficient to explain what's going on there and that phenotype. But it didn't really happen. You know, that, 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 that's rare. It would be very hard to get two mutations at once, especially these duplications are kind of rare to begin with. So you're never, you, you probably can't hit that jackpot very often in terms of the experiment, especially if you kind of were trying to get them both at the same time um, because the citrate, weak citrate utilization is not very good. Um, and so we wanted to ask, basically, if we tried re-evolving this many times, if I took the ancestor, would be, there would be a probability this happened. If I took the one where it happened, is it the same probability? Or if I took you know, one in the middle, is it just always the same probability? Is this like always tough and really rare? Or is there something that happened particularly in these cells that made it more likely to be able to access that in terms of the earlier mutations? So was there some historical contingency on the pathway of evolutions, a pathway of mutations that had happened earlier? So again, we tested this with replay experiments. I should say, actually, that Zach Blount, who was looking up at Darwin on the first slide, did the mega experiments to test this involving tons and tons and tons of petri dishes and a lot of patients. And this is showing a, a tree where we picked out different bacteria. We sequenced their genomes so we could figure out their relationships. And this is the point where the citrate utilization evolved. And he picked a lot of different ones from different places on this tree. And the upshot of his experiments were that if you go right before where it evolved, it's really rare for this to happen. If you go to some of the relatives over here, it's extremely rare, but occasionally it happens. And if you go earlier, it just never happens. So there is something that has happened along this lineage that has made it more likely to be able to access what's going on here. And so we have some sort of historical contingency, maybe two separate phases of that to make it more and more likely over time. And probably that's related to changing metabolism. Citric acid, if you're a biochemist, there's the citric acid cycle. Um, it's part of your central carbon metabolism. The organisms do it. But these organisms also have to put in and take out a lot of things out of that citric acid cycle in a really balanced way. And so that's why it's probably very bad to first develop this. As things are just unbalanced. And in fact, later we've started looking at the cells. And even the cells that get a benefit from this, a lot of them are just dying <laughs> because they're not used to growing and using, utilizing the nutrients in this particular way. And, you know, kind of to drive that home, even in the actual population, if we tracked these different cohorts of mutations, this, these are the ancestors of what eventually evolved citrate utilization. At that point, they basically took over the population and diversified in all kinds of interesting ways. But right before it evolved, they were super rare. They were like almost on their way to extinction. So they were not much better than anything else. They were maybe even worse. So one thing that we've gone back and done is we've kind of asked, well, okay, if I put that first mutation that gives rudimentary utilization of citrate in these earlier strains, 
is it any is it able to get any advantage from it? Like, is that a beneficial mutation step, or is it just deleterious and you have to survive long enough to get the next mutation that's beneficial? And so to summarize a lot of those experiments, and also to average together a lot of different things, it turns out if you put that mutation back into the ancestor of kind of what was about to evolve citrate utilization, it's like slightly beneficial, just tiny bit, only like 2%, much smaller than those differences I was talking about before. What's kind of interesting is if you put it in earlier middle ones of this population, it's terrible. Something about the way the metabolism had evolved in those cells made it impossible to access this step at all. And maybe even a little more puzzling is if you put it in the ancestor or strains very early, it's actually beneficial again. So now you might be why it was beneficial. Why didn't that first step happen early on and coexist long enough for the second step to happen and get the huge advantage? And the answer is competition was a lot stiffer earlier in the, in the experiment. So a 2% benefit was nothing compared to an 8% benefit, a 9% benefit, a 10% benefit. So probably it, was, it may have evolved, but it was probably driven extinct before that next step could happen in the early, early in the experiment. Great. And so, so basically it was kind of this change over time, and this is what had made it, made it accessible and able to evolve, changed it into a beneficial mutation. And, you know, we, we could think a little bit about this as evolutionary innovation. And what I want to stress is that there were phases here of this thing. There was that rudimentary phase where it wasn't clear that it was going to lead to some huge innovation, but it existed as a trait that could be improved by later evolution. And so people think a lot about irreducible complexity, development of eyes, and some stories like this. And this is a very simple example where you can have that rudimentary trait evolve and actually be beneficial and compete and coexist for long enough for the further refinement of it to happen and the kind of first, first time that we become fully citrate, util, citrate, able to use citrate. And the other thing I want to say is that after citrate evolved, the game changed completely. In fact, certain ways the metabolism had evolved early on, it evolved mutations that reversed those things because it's so fundamentally different. It's lifestyle now. And there's some ways of defining E. coli if you're in a clinic where you're trying to figure out what bacterium is causing some trouble for a patient, where they test them for using citrate under conditions with oxygen. And that's one, that's one a negative on that test is one diagnostic for E. coli. So this thing has gone around that and changed in a way that's kind of changed its, its nature pretty fundamentally. Great. So, uh, you know, this kind of optimization process of glucose in this one flask led to a certain trajectory which made a kind of leap, but not, 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 a, not an unusual leap, kind of a gradual leap, something that would happen and you know, could consistently happen over time based on what had happened earlier appear in this population. Now you might be asking yourself, but you've been propagating those other 11 flasks for another like 20 years now. Um, no, none of them have evolved citrate utilization. And we think that they might be stuck in that kind of valley where they've completely made that, that trajectory inaccessible um, based on kind of the random, random chance of how they've changed their metabolism. Great. So just reflect for one second and say this is a very simple system. Bacteria in a flask in the lab, right? I'm super interested in what's happening in more complicated environments. Um, I haven't even told you some of the cool things that happen in the long-term experiment. There's some ecological diversity that develops and coexists. So we get development of kind of not just one microbe, but two kinds of microbes in one of the flasks that coexist. But I also study the bee gut microbiome where you have cool different species like in our microbiome coexisting. And we don't know a lot about evolution of these things. Although all of you are doing an E. coli evolution experiment right now, right? The problem is the E. coli only divides about once a day in the human gut. And, uh, and so, you know, it's a little, little bit slower, and, but a more complicated environment. Um, but super interested in how animal plant associated microbiomes, things in nature are evolving. And there's a lot of mechanisms that they have access to trading genes, recombining genomes to generate new types of diversity that don't exist in this simple system. Bacterial viruses move DNA around and infect and cause evolutionary pressures on, uh, on the bacteria. So there's a lot going on in nature. And some of my colleagues add back in those, those ingredients in new evolution experiments and have found really interesting things. So I think the, the last thing I want to say is you can check out our website. We have links to a lot of things. Some of what I've covered tonight, today has been covered in some popular science types books. This is a book about kind of E. coli and its history in studying science by Carl Zimmer, who writes for the New York Times. 
Um, this, this, there's a story about citrate evolution in this book by Richard Dawkins. And um, I guess tomorrow I'm giving another talk, which is a little bit more applied in thinking about um, how you translate some of the things we learn in these simple systems to medicine and biotechnology on, on some scale. And then I want to thank my lab, my current lab, just for you know, being patient on the weekends doing this. People continue this, this through Christmas, Thanksgiving. Someone is always tending to the bacteria, and they have to be very careful and very, very good ex experimentalists um, doing this kind of stuff. And I'll just leave it there and especially thank the NSF, which provides us with funding, which is normally funding where people are keeping an ecological site somewhere in nature going and sampling it over time. And we're sampling our little flasks over time and laying down this, these artificial histories for other people to study and learn about evolution. So thanks a lot. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there's time for that. Sure. When you uh, sequence the genome for the bacteria, what, is, how does, what does that look like? Okay, yeah, the question was, what is sequencing the genomes of these bacteria look like? Um, there's, there's a lot of cool technologies now, like next generation sequencing, you hear about this. And it's kind of like you get a ton of little snippets of the genome, um, a lot of short little snippets, and then you, you compare those snippets to the original genome, and you see where there's parts that mismatch or parts that are misplaced, and you stitch together an idea of which bases have changed. And for some of the stuff I showed you, we sequence not just one bacterium, which has one genome, we sequence the mixture of bacterium, which has many different genomes. And so you kind of compare stuff and you look at these, we call them reads, these short uh, numbers of bases. Now, a c another cool technology has come around where you don't sequence short snippets, you sequence like super long pieces of DNA, 10,000 base pairs rather than 200 base pairs. And what's that, what that has led us to, and hopefully it'll be a cool story you know, five years from now or whenever my, my students finish it, is look at cases where big pieces of the genome have flipped over or changed in really large scale ways, not just one DNA base mutating or um, one, one transposon jumping somewhere else in the genome. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Way over my head, but kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can learn a lot with sequencing these days. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, do you have any like, theories of what might happen further along the line, maybe years ah. from now? That yeah. Yeah, so the question was, are there any theories I have about what might happen later in the experiment? You know, one, one of the, one of the, one thing I'm kind of curious about is people argue a lot about definitions of bacterial species, what a bacterial species is. Sometimes they just compare the genomes and they're like, well, if 99% of the nucleotides are the same, it's like the same species. Um, if we evolve this for long enough, we should reach that point where we have more divergence than that. It can only get more different than the natural E. coli, right? So, and maybe we have 12 different kinds of E. coli, but there's also other definitions where you kind of see if, if, bact if part of the genome of one bacterium can go into the other genome, meaning they can kind of mate as close as we can say that for bacteria, which would be the, the, spe the species definition we use for lots of animals and plants. Um, and eventually they'll be so different that moving that DNA will probably be very bad for them. And so they would also be kind of separate by that species definition. So I don't know if I will live long enough for it, but eventually these might reach some of those thresholds to uh, be different species by some of those definitions. I think people will argue a lot about that though. It's a good because, but it will challenge some of those uh, people to come up with good arguments, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, hope, I hope that there's some other interesting things that happen. One thing we thought might happen is that it would be somewhat advantageous perhaps to evolve a circadian rhythm if the cells could somehow have something that was oscillating in timing so that they would know precisely when they're being fed. Um, probably there's not enough of an advantage for that to, to happen. Like they, they wake up fast enough that it's not better to kind of be ahead of the curve by, uh, by doing that. But, for a little while, we, we tricked ourselves into thinking they might be doing that. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, please. I'm 
visualize all the different populations that are in there? Is it just by genetics or are there different features that you're looking at when you're looking at a population that has a lot of stuff? And what impact does it is there for just taking a little bit of that bacterial culture? Right, right. The, the, question, the question was how do we characterize the diversity in the population and what is the impact also that every single day we throw away 99% of the, of the bacterial cells, right, and they, they lose. So, you know, even though we throw away 99%, we keep a lot. So it, it turns out that, yes, we're throwing away some beneficial mutations, but probably that doesn't, like, slow down evolution very much if people do models and things like this. Um, you, can, you can model what would happen if kind of we took out a very small amount and added only back a very small amount and only did that, and it's not that much different. Mostly it is genetics to figure out the mixture of things that's in there. I mean, I will say that there's fascinating biology that even two genetically identical bacteria, due to one making a little bit more of this protein randomly than this other protein, can get stuck in different states and actually have different behaviors and things. And we haven't really studied whether our bacteria have these different phenotypic states. And I don't know what I would expect. Like, should they be worse at always having the same state because they're in such a coddled, nice environment? Or should they be better at having one state and not going into the, any of these other states, which can be like temporarily not growing, which is good sometimes if somebody gives antibiotics to be temporarily not growing. And that's one reason people study the, these diversity that can happen that's not genetic in bacterial populations. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, that was a great question. There were a few parts. One was, are people doing things other than DNA sequencing? Are they looking at, like, how much gene expression, how much, how, how, does the, how does the composition of the RNAs and the proteins inside of the cells change, which is often related, like a mutation will change those things, but in complex ways, right? And the answer is yes, um, to, to an extent. There have been some studies of this, and even metabolomics, so measuring the compounds that are in the cells. And mostly you find that they're actually evolving convergently even at that level. That even though the mutations might be in different genes, kind of downstream they're having the same effect on the same pathway. A lot of the time. It's not identical, certainly. And then you mentioned a little bit about methylation and things like that. I think conventional wisdom would be that in E. coli there's not a lot of that type of modification that's affecting it. I'm not going to say there is not, certainly in, in some bacteria modifying the DNA versus mutating the DNA can lead to heritable changes. But I'm not aware that's important in R. E. coli. Yeah. Yeah. In the E. coli, how do you tell like, if they're mutating or not? Is it based on their fitness and color, or are there other things that you can tell? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, certainly if you, you kind of, what you do is you have the population. The population is a mixture of many different things. You dilute it and you spread it on these little auger plates, and then you pick individual colonies, each of which it was one cell, right? And then competing them is definitely one way that you can tell things are different. It turns out it's actually easier just to sequence their genomes these days, though. And so that takes a lot less effort. And then you actually know the, every single nucleotide of their genome, and you can read that out. The trouble, and this is related to the last question, is understanding the significance of one of those mutations. We don't have models of a cell that are near good enough to predict even that if I knock out this gene, like I destroy a gene, how it affects everything else, let alone how I kind of tweak the function of a gene or mutate this one particular site in this particular protein structure. Um, so you know, maybe this is an area where the mod models could get better. We have alpha fold for folding proteins and all this AI stuff. I'm hoping that eventually the whole cell models that people have will get better and, and kind of lead to better understanding of what's going on there. The link, we call it like the link between the genotype or the genome and the phenotype, like the traits. That map is very hard right now to figure out. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks. If you have any more questions, feel free to find me and, and talk to me. That was really fun.